All right, I want you to turn to two passages of Scripture, please. Turn to John chapter 3 and Matthew 7. In other words, open your Bible to John 3 and then put a marker at Matthew chapter 7. We're in a series called Game Changer. And don't forget, next weekend, Michael Jr. will be here during the message time. It is a great, great, great opportunity to invite people to church. Uh, many people have heard him on Comedy Central, Jay Leno, uh, you know, the Laugh Channel, things like that. So invite someone to hear Michael, and he's going to do some humor and then share his uh, testimony. So um, please come next weekend. Last week, I asked you uh, a game-changing question, and that question was, who's in charge? Well, this week, I have another game-changing question for you, and the title of the message this week is, Have You Been Born Again? Have you been born again? Now, before you dismiss this question, because you've attended church for a long time, or you've walked an aisle, or you've made some sort of a decision, I want you to know that it is scriptural for people who attend church to examine themselves when it comes to being born again. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul said, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. And this is the most important game-changing question you could ever answer. Have I truly been born again? So John chapter 3, let's read a few verses here. John 3 verse 1 says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. Now this is very important what he's saying as a Pharisee. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, said to him, thank you so much. No, I'm, I'm just joking. I, I just... I, it's always just struck me oddly that Nicodemus comes and he pays him this great compliment, and Jesus says to him, you're going to hell, Nicodemus, uh, So it, it, basically. <laughs> Verse 3, Jesus answered, said to him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I mean, Jesus just gets right to the point. Nicodemus said to him, now watch, these are good questions. How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water, now that's referring to natural birth, not baptism, that's referring to natural birth, because he says the womb. How can a man enter into his mother's womb? That's a womb of water, okay? And uh, if, if, uh, if, if the water breaks, you better be close to someone who knows something about birthing babies, you know, at that point. So that's what Jesus was referring to. He says, that which is uh, most assuredly, unless one is born of water, natural birth, and the spirit, spiritual birth, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now we know again he's talking about natural and spiritual because look at the ver next verse. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. There's natural birth. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, now watch this carefully, this is Jesus speaking, you must be born again. Notice he didn't say you should be. This is something you might want to consider. He said, you want to go to heaven? You must be born again. And that's point number one. We're going to dissect this passage. First point, number one, you must be born again. Now, so many times we write off the Pharisees because Jesus did get on them for legalism. They they got into such a legalistic following of the Scripture and then making up rules and adding rules and regulation to it that, yes, Jesus got on that. But all of the Pharisees were not bad guys. As a matter of fact, they were the most conservative theologians of the day. They believed in God. They worshiped God. They believed in the Scripture. When you think about this, think about just Nick, simply Nicodemus as a Pharisee. First of all, he attended church faithfully. He attended church he prayed. He read the Bible. As a matter of fact, in order to be a Pharisee, you actually had to memorize the first five books of the Old Testament. Now, I know that that doesn't impress you because you did that a long time ago, and, you know, it's not that tough to memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Leviticus, by the way, is the book that you fudge in when you're reading through the Bible in a year. 
Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So he attended church faithfully, he prayed, he read the Bible, not only read the Bible, but memorized the Bible, uh, much of the Bible. He um, uh, fasted twice. Matter of fact, to be a Pharisee, you had to fast twice a week. Let me say that again, twice a week. That, that's two times more than most of us fast, okay? Uh, he uh, tithed. In other words, he gave 10% of his income to the church. And here's something else about Pharisees that we don't think about a lot. They believed in God. And they believed in the one true God. They believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And let me tell you something about Nicodemus. I believe from this passage he believed in Jesus. He comes to Jesus and he said, I believe he came from God. I believe you're who you say you are. No one could do the miracles which you do unless God was with him. He recognized he came from God. He recognized that uh, he had the signs of a true man of God that because the signs that he did, and he recognized that God was with him. So here's the amazing thing about this passage of Scripture. Think about this. Jesus says to a man who attends church faithfully, prays, reads the Bible, tithes, fast, believes in God, and believes in Jesus. You must be born again. You are not going to go to heaven, Nicodemus, unless you're born again. And he didn't say this to a prostitute or someone on the street. He said this to a man who went to church, who prayed, who fasted, who tithed, who believed in God, and even believed in Jesus. I think there are a lot of people who mentally believe in Jesus but have never been born again. They've never submitted their lives to Him. So number one, you must be born again. You must be born again. Here's number two. Many people have not been born again. Many people who think they have have not been born again. Now, flip back there to Matthew 7. Maybe you put a marker or you can just flip back. It's pretty easy to find. Matthew chapter 7. This is a passage from the Sermon on the Mount. Probably the most famous message that we have from Jesus. And I want you to notice what it says. Matthew 7, look at verses 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many. Could you just say that word out loud? All the campuses, just say many. Many. There are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Could you say the word few? Okay. So there are many on the broad road. There are few on the narrow road. Everyone see that? And that's Jesus talking, all right? There are many that are going to destruction, and there are few that are going to life. Now, when I ask you a question, I want you to answer me every campus. Answer me out loud, okay? Is many less than are more than few. Okay, I'm not trying to trick you. It's just, it's, I'm just asking you straight out because you think I'm, you know, preachers trick you a lot, and, and I do that too because it's fun. But here's the point. Is many, let me say it again, is many less than or more than few? Okay, you know what that just told me? More people are going to hell than are going to heaven. You, you all agreed that many was more than. And Jesus said, many people are going toward destruction. Few are going toward life. That means more people are going to hell than are going to heaven. But we don't think about that. Because when we go to funerals, no matter how the guy lived, the preacher says, we know John's in a better place. And he may have lived like the devil. But you've probably never been to a funeral where the preacher said, we all know John's in hell. He was a scoundrel, lived like the devil, he's in hell. Just want you to know that. I actually have a, a friend of mine that, that got saved out of a gang. And, and when members of the gang or his friends died, they would ask him to come preach the funeral. And he's the only preacher that I know that ever got up, and, he, and, his, and his, uh, his friends had horrible names, you know, horrible names. I mean, he would say, y'all know Slash Knife is in hell. You know he's in hell. And I'm telling you, the butcher, you're going to hell too. You're going to hell, I'm telling you. And he would say that to him. And then he would stand at the casket when people would walk by, and he'd say to him, you want to go to heaven or hell? Just like that. And they'd say, well, I don't want to decide right now. And he'd say, hell, you want to go to heaven or hell? 
And he led a lot of people to the Lord right there at the casket. But here's what happens at a funeral. You know how the guy lived, and the preacher says, well, we serve a God of love. We serve a God of grace, and he's in a better place. And so the devil says to you, hey, if he made it, you'll make it. I'm asking you, have you been born again? You can't ask yourself a more important question than this question right here. you to join us each week on The Blessed Life with Pastor Robert Morris. Experience dynamic Bible-based teaching. Enjoy freedom through the inspiring worship of the Gateway Worship Team. It's a time to grow, be encouraged, and learn how to live the blessed life. The Blessed Life with Gateway Church's Robert Morris, Thursdays on the Daystar Television Network. Look, look on, on down, look at verse 21, Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many, there's that word again, will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, watch this carefully, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. We, we, we've never even met. And these are people who are actively engaged in the work of God. They said, we cast out demons in your name. We prophesied in your name. We did many wonders in your name. Okay, here's a very simple question I have for you. If many people, if many, that Jesus used the word many, if many people actively engaged in the work of God are not saved, how many more just attend church? How many more just attend at Easter and Christmas that aren't saved? Why do so many people think they are, and why is there so much confusion over being born again? I think it really relates to us not understanding the process of being born again. Jesus is the one that, that likens spiritual, um, uh, getting saved, let's say that, to birth. He says you were born on earth, you need to be born from above. You need to be born spiritually. You need to be born again. I'm reading one day, just reading through the Bible, and I find this scripture because I've, I've heard these testimonies my whole life that to me don't line up with the Bible. I hear people say things like this, you know, I was saved when I was a child, uh, but I didn't change. My life did not, I was saved and I didn't change. And, and I didn't grow and I didn't read my Bible and, uh, and I went off to college or went into the service and man, I lived like the devil and I just did all sorts of horrible things. And, uh, and then uh, I, I, I sold out, I, I, I gave everything to God and that's when the change came. And I think to myself, where is that in the Bible? that you got saved and didn't change, and then later you rededicated your life and everything changed. Where, where is that? And so one day I'm, I'm reading along and I see this scripture and I realize why so many people have messed up testimonies. Uh, Hosea 9:11 says, as for Ephraim, and this is an analogy that God is using here, their glory shall fly away like a bird. In other words, the glory is going to depart because Ephraim has departed from me. And Ephraim could be a type and shadow of the church. But watch what happens when the glory of the church departs. No birth, no pregnancy, and no conception. Uh, here, here's what, it just hit me all of a sudden. We hear all these testimonies, I got saved, but I didn't grow. And it's like the problem is growth after salvation, growth after being born again. But here's what hit me when I read that. You realize there's growth before birth? There's growth before salvation? Because Jesus said you must be born again. But I want you to think about this in the natural. Has a baby ever been born and then immediately, or I mean conceived and then immediately born? Let me, let me ask the experts here, ladies. Has a, has a baby ever been conceived and immediately the baby was born? Has that ever happened? No. There is, there is a, a period 
between, normally nine months, between conception and birth. And what is that called? Pregnancy. Yeah, uh, in, in another service, one of the ladies said, hell. Well, not, now, let's just stick, let's just stick with the, the medical term, okay? Here's the point. In the natural, a baby is conceived, and then there's pregnancy, and then there's birth. And, 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 and that pregnancy period, especially as it goes on, and especially if it's August and it's uh, in the summer in Texas, uh, the, the point is, what, it's, it's a miserable time. I mean, it's miserable. Okay, now I want you to think about this. A baby is conceived, there's a miserable time, even though there's joy coming, there's a miserable time. And, and I know it's miserable because I'm married to the sweetest, sweetest woman in the world. But she totally changed when she got pregnant. I mean, I would come home and I'd say, uh, sugar, is dinner about ready? You try carrying the basketball around your stuff. You know, I mean, it's just, it's horrible. So anyway, <laughs> she was miserable. I understand that. Okay, uh, here's the point. Conception, miserable time, birth, okay? You hear these testimonies. Uh, I was saved when I was eight, but I, I didn't understand everything. I didn't grow and I didn't read my Bible. And uh, I got away, and I was in sin, I did all these horrible things, and I was miserable. That's what they all say. Now, I was miserable. And then I sold out to God, and I really gave everything, and that's when my life changed. Is it possible that the reason people say that is they're calling conception salvation? When the seed was conceived, when they opened up to the possibility that yes, God is in the world and Jesus is the Son of God, and they open their heart and there's a seed conceived. And then they go through time, but you personally have to come to the place where you give control of your life to, to God. You have to, see the question really is, like I said last week, who's in charge? And there are a whole lot of people that have had the seed of the Word of God conceived in them, and they're miserable, but they have not been born again yet. So, Here's my third question, very simple. How can I know? How, how can I know if I've been born again? Uh, 1 John 5 verse 13 says, These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. That you may know that you have eternal life. So, how can I know? You, you realize a lot of people doubt this. They doubt. They've had many, many experiences and they doubt. As a matter of fact, they'll hear, they'll hear a message like this, and they'll say, um, uh, God, if I'm not saved, save me. Okay, let me tell you why that prayer doesn't work. I can tell you a few reasons, but number one, uh, you've prayed it more than once. So if it worked, you don't have to pray it one time. But another reason it works, and this is the scriptural reason, you don't get saved by saying to God, God, if I do need you, then save me. If I am lost, then save me. But if I don't need you, never mind. You don't get saved that way. You get saved by admitting to God you're lost and you're on your way to hell and you need a Savior. So how can I know if I'm saved? How can I know if I'm born again? Well, let me clear up some other misconception. Um, uh, people have asked me, Pastor, do you have to remember the date that you got saved? You know, the video testimony we just saw, he said February 16th. Uh, and it was a different year, but I was saved on February 16th. Now, I remember the date. My wife does not remember the date. She didn't write it down anywhere. She doesn't know the date. But she does remember truly being saved, born again. So, let, let me give you an analogy on, on whether you have to know the date or not. You don't have to know the date, by the way. But let me give you the analogy. Um, um, you might forget the date that you were married once. Uh, you probably won't forget it again if your spouse hears about it, but you, you might forget the date, but you don't forget the event. You don't forget that, that your life radically changed at that point, and someone moved in with you and is living with you now, and has been living with you since then. Okay, when you get saved, listen, your life radically changes, and someone moves in with you. See, I, I don't understand, and I really believe that people need to nail down that maybe you were saved after you think you were, if your life has truly changed. Whenever your life changed, that's when you got saved. But if your life hasn't changed radically, you haven't been saved yet. And, and I don't understand some of the answers that I get. 
I'll say to people, um, are you saved? And they'll say, uh, well, um, I think I am. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I am. Yeah, yeah, I would have to say I am. Okay, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. Or, or then I'll ask them, when did you get saved? And they'll say something like this. Well, now that's always been a tough one for me. Um, it, it could have happened when I was eight. Uh, it, it might have happened when I was 14 at youth camp, or it might have been when I was 25. I, I, would, say, I would say eight or 25. Eight, eight or 25, probably. Yeah, 25, maybe eight. I say, I don't understand that. Because I did walk the aisle many times as a, as a youngster. I did that many times. I, I got baptized three times before I actually got saved. But when I got saved, there's no doubt. Because my life changed radically. My desires changed. God did a miracle in my heart. But I had to give him total control. The reason I don't understand those statements, just again, liken it to marriage. If you talked to me after the service and you said, Pastor Robert, are you married? And I said, well, I think I am. Yeah, 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 I would say I am, yeah. What would you think? You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, something's wrong with this guy. Or if you said to me, well, Pastor Robert, when did you get married? And I said, well, that's always been a tough one for me. Uh, it might have been when I was eight. Um, it it might have been when I was 14 at youth camp or, or 25. I would say eight or, or 25. It makes no sense. And the reason that I believe so many people are confused is because they don't understand, listen, when you get saved, the responsibility of change is not on you. It's on God. The responsibility you have is that you give control of your life to God. And if you don't give Him control, your life won't change. That, that's, what, that's why I don't like these testimonies. I was saved and I didn't change. You don't have to change. You just have to be saved. You have to come and give control of your life to Jesus. And when you give Him control, He changes you. And then, yes, we grow, and yes, we learn, but God has done a change in our hearts. There's a change. In The God I Never Knew, Robert Morris explains that the Holy Spirit's chief desire is for a relationship with you to offer the encouragement and guidance of a trusted friend. I want you to understand that all of these gifts, all of God's gifts have to do with ministering to people and they have to do with encouraging people. It's time to experience the Holy Spirit in a fresh new way to meet the God you may have never known. You have someone living inside of you who knows everything about everything. And he has committed himself to be your teacher and to lead you into all truth. Let me give you an illustration. Um, let's just, just use the pen for a moment. Every one of us are born going the wrong way. We're all born going the wrong way. We don't have to teach our children to be bad. It comes naturally for them. So we're all, we're all going the wrong way. We're actually all going toward hell, okay? So um, that section right over there, that's hell. I'm sorry, but you're <laughs> sealing hell today. Okay, so we're all born going the wrong way. I grew up going to church, and my parents told me about the right way, and I wanted to go the right way, but I couldn't, couldn't go the right way. And I would try. I would just, oh. Oh, I got to do the right thing. I got to do the right thing. I got to do the right thing. But if I ever let the pressure off, boy, I just went right back to doing the wrong thing. And I walked the aisle and I signed the card and I did all those things. When I was 19, I said, God, I'm not playing games with you anymore. I give you complete control of my life. And I remember saying to God, but God, I can't change. I have tried to change and I can't change, but I give you complete control today. When I did that, it was like God reached down from heaven into my heart and went, floop, and He changed the polarity of my heart. And I didn't want to go that way anymore. I wanted to go the right way. I wanted to go toward heaven. Y'all are in heaven, so you, you picked a good seat. Okay. I want to do the right thing anymore. Listen, I was on drugs. I, I was immoral. I was, I was a bad person, and I wanted to do those things. I got saved. I didn't want to do those things anymore. He changed my want to. 
I wanted to do the right thing. Now, here's what I found since I've gotten saved. I found that if I put pressure on myself, I can now do the wrong thing. But I have to put pressure on myself now to do the wrong thing. No, no, I'm not forgiving her. No, she does this all the time. No, God, no, no, no. Boy, okay, I forgive her. <laughs> it's my default now to do the right thing. Before I got saved, it was my default to do the wrong thing. So here's what I'm asking you. When did that happen? When did you stop making the decisions for the direction of your life? And when did you say, God, I give you complete control, and God changed your heart? When did that happen? If it's never happened, or if you're not sure when it happened, why would you not nail it down today? Because you are basing all eternity on whether you've been born again or not. You're not basing eternity on whether you attend church. Because there's nowhere in the Bible says if you attend church, you go to heaven. You're not basing eternity on whether you've ever read part of the Bible or if you've ever prayed. You're not basing eternity on that. Here's what Jesus said. You want to go to heaven? You must be born again. So why, if you have any doubt, why would you not nail it down today? I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want to help you, every person who struggles in this area, I want to nail it down and so you will never doubt it again, so that you will know for sure. You will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have given control of your life to Jesus Christ. No matter which campus you're attending, I want to ask you a very simple question, and I want to ask you to be honest with me. Just be honest with me. No one's looking around. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. I'm the, one, I'm the only one looking around. How many of you would be honest to say, Pastor Robert, to be honest with you and with God, I really don't know for sure. If I died today, I'm not sure that I'd go to heaven. I know God loves me. I know Jesus died for me. But to be honest, I'm not sure if I died today, I'd go to heaven. Would you just put your hand up? Put it way up high where I can see it. Way up high. Every campus, second level at South Lake, everywhere. God bless you. God bless you. You can put your hands down. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being honest. Thank you. I don't think you'd have put your hand up if the Holy Spirit wasn't drawing you. So I want to help you right now. Let's nail it down today. I want to lead you in a prayer. And I believe with all of my heart that you are as serious as you can be. You wouldn't have put your hand up. You would not have done that if you weren't serious about this. So I just want to help you. If you put your hand up, no matter which campus you're attending, just pray this in your heart. Pray right now after me. Just say, Dear God, Tell him that. Say, Dear God, I ask you to forgive me. Tell him, I ask you to forgive me for all of my sin. And I receive Jesus. Tell him that. I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I give you my life. I give you my life. Tell him, I give you my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me today. Now, no one's looking around again. At every campus, how many of you would say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer, and I really am in business with God. Would you put your hand up? Put it way up high. I mean, you ought to be proud to put it up. I prayed that prayer, and I really am in business with God. Every campus, God bless you. Now, if you put your hand up, just those of you that put your hand up, you can put your hands down, but would you just, just those of you that prayed the prayer, would you just lift your head and look at me for a moment? Just, just no matter which campus you're attending, just lift your head and look at me. I, I am so proud of you. I am so proud of you. You made the best decision you could ever make. But it's very, very important what I'm about to say to you. I'm going to ask you to do something that is very important. I want to pray with you again. And I want you to take a stand for Jesus today. Don't let the devil talk you out of this. If you're in the second level at South Lake, no matter which campus you're attending, if you prayed that prayer, you're looking at me right now. If you prayed that prayer and you made business with God, I want you to just get up out of your seat and come and stand right at the front, right here. So I want to pray with you, all right? Please, just, just do it right now. Just do it right now. If you're at another campus, just get up and come to the front of the campus, all right? Come on, don't let, don't, don't, don't let the devil talk to you out. Come on, come on. If you prayed that prayer and you really meant it, if you're on the second level, just you can come to the side and come down the stairs. I know it's a little farther, but come on. Come on, just come right down here to the front. Come on, come on. Come on. Isn't this great? Come on. If you prayed that prayer and gave your life to the Lord, come on. Take a stand for Jesus today.
All right? Come on. Come on. Yeah, let's thank the Lord. Come on. Thank the Lord for these. Come on. Yeah, you can stand up if you're seated. You can stand up, help people get out a little easier, all right? Come on. Come on, I'm going to wait till you get down here if you're coming. Some of you from the second level. If you're at another campus, please just come to the front. Come on. Don't, don't let Satan take you up, talk you out of this, all right? Come on. I want to pray with you. Okay, now, if you, may, you may still be making your way to the front, but here's the reason I asked you to come. Here's the reason. Jesus said, if you'll confess me before me, I'll confess you before my Father. You are making a public stand today. I'm giving my life to Jesus. The other thing, the Bible says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. So I ask you to pray in your heart. Here's the reason I want to pray with you. I, I want you to pray out loud. Now, you don't have to pray loudly. Okay, don't be embarrassed, all right? But you're down here because you're giving your life to Jesus, all right? So I want to lead you again in a prayer. And I want you to just, just say this out loud. If you're watching another campus or if you're watching in South Lake even, I want you just to say this. Say this prayer out loud. So will you just pray it out to me? Say it loud, all right? Say, Dear God, I receive Jesus as my Lord and as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. I was 19 years old when I gave my life to the Lord and everything changed. I didn't have any desire to go back to that old life. I wanted to walk with the Lord and learn more about Him. And some people helped me to learn the Bible and to learn how to pray and to learn about my new life in Christ. And that's what we want to do for you. I am so excited that you've given your life to the Lord. He's forgiven all of your sins and you're on your way to heaven. But we need to learn some things now about the Bible, about prayer, about some basics of the Christian life so that you can be victorious and live for the Lord like I know you want to. So we've designed a class called Fresh Start. And I wanna encourage you to sign up for this class because we wanna help you grow in your walk with the Lord now. I love you and I'm so proud of you. Experience Gateway Church Live from anywhere you are at gatewaypeople.tv. If you have internet access on your computer or mobile device, you are only a click away from experiencing great worship and teaching. Don't miss church because you're on vacation, out of town on business, or even if you're just feeling a bit under the weather. Visit gatewaypeople.tv and be a part of our live service. For service times, visit gatewaypeople.tv.